months before the Emancipation Proclamation, 10,000 self-emancipated people left their owners. They crossed the Rappahannock River and traveled 14 difficult miles across Stafford County, Virginia, to a quiet landing on the Potomac River. From there, they boarded ships and moved on to freedom in the north. John Washington was one of those 10,000. He wrote a unique memoir of his personal trail to freedom. Now you can experience the trail through his eyes. You can see where he crossed the river, worked for the Union Army as a free man, and realized that his freedom was paid by soldiers' lives. The following video is primarily intended for viewing at the 10 stops along the Stafford Trail to Freedom driving tour. We invite you to come take the tour, learn more, and follow the footsteps of the Courageous 10,000. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord, how warm to cross over into camp So this is the Rappahannock River. It sure doesn't look like my condo's view of the Chicago River back home. I remember when I was a kid, great-grandfather Eddie told me he was a slave, and he crossed the Rappahannock River during the Civil War on his way to freedom. And he said, when the Union Army came to Fredericksburg, his owner was so scared that he could just walk away. This is nice. I'm glad I flew in a few days early, just before my meeting in DC tomorrow. There was just something about that Trail to Freedom website that drew me down here to Stafford. John Washington came ashore and stepped into freedom right here. Right here? How does anybody know that? Maybe he wrote about it. In that great getting up morning, fare you well, fare you well. Here it is. In I'm in company with James, with James Washington. Washington. My first cousin and another free colored man. We left the town near the woolen mills and proceeded up the road leading to Falmouth, our object being to get right opposite the Union camp and listen to the great number of bands then playing those marching tunes, the Star Spangled Banner, Red, White, and Blue, etc. We left the road just before we got to Ficklin's Mill and walked down to the river. The long line of sentinels on the other side was doing duty close to the water's edge. Very soon, one of a party of soldiers called out, do any of you want to come over? Everybody said no. But I hollered out, yes, I want to come over. All right, bully for you, was the response. And they soon was over to our side. I greeted them gladly and stepped into their boat. As soon as James saw my determination to go, he joins me, and the other young man came along with us. But how do we know this is the spot? Wait a minute. Wasn't there a drawing by John Washington in the back? Ah, here it is. Look there. He squiggled a line across the river. What's number 16 mean? Oh, his note for 16 says, where I cross the river. John Washington, Don't you let no after 150 you years, you you're talking to me here today. Imagine 10,000 self-emancipated slaves cross the river to Stafford County 
my ancestor may have walked right here like John Washington. Yes, this is really getting interesting. Well, I don't need to drive to the Conway house. After reading about Moncure Daniel Conway, it's good to see where he grew up. His family owned slaves, and he took slavery for granted as a youngster. But he eventually became one of the most prominent abolitionists in the country. He even consulted with President Lincoln on the subject. Talk about an outcast from the family, my goodness. He even referred to himself as the black sheep. So this is the door the Union soldiers broke in. I printed Moncure Conway's account of that. Here it is. My father, father was, was in Fredericksburg, Fred and my two brothers far away in the Confederate ranks. The house was left empty and locked up, the house servants remaining in their abode in the backyard. It was never known who fired the shot. Our Negroes assured me that the house was locked and watched. Yet, as the Union soldiers were filing past, the shot was fired from a window of Conway House, or from a corner of its yard, and the soldier wounded. The Union soldiers, alarmed and enraged, battered down the doors, and finding no one, began vengeance on the furniture. It happened, however, that in my mother's bedroom was hung a portrait of myself, and this caught the eye of a youth who'd known me in Washington. He cried to his fierce comrades to stop. The servants were called in and were much relieved when they found that it was to speak of my portrait. Old Eliza cried, It's Mars Monk the Preacher, as good an abolitionist as any of you. It was some consolation to me that, though long regarded as the black sheep of the family, my portrait saved Conway House from destruction, for that was contemplated. Hmm, there's been a church on these grounds since the 1730s. Churches on this hill have had a lot of damage across the centuries. This one was no exception. The Federal-style building was here in the 1820s. The Falmouth Union Church website says that it was occupied by the Union troops starting in 1862. That squares with John Washington's drawing. It looks like all the high ground up here was used as a Union camp. Somewhere in this cemetery is where John Washington watched the burial of seven cavalry troops killed in the taking of Falmouth. He wrote about that. Here it is. We were all, we were all stirred, stirred very, very early, early the, the next day. morning for the soldiers had a sad duty to perform. The night before they captured Falmouth, they, while advancing suddenly in the darkness, found the road barricaded. The rebels concealed close by fired upon the advancing troops where the road was cut through a hill and killed seven and wounded several. The funeral was one of the most solemn and impressive I had ever witnessed in my life before. The cavalry company was dismounted and drawn up in line around the seven new graves which had been dug side by side. And amidst grand old tombs and vaults, surrounded by noble cedars through which the April wind seemed to moan low dirges, there they was now about to deposit the remains of what the rebels used to term the low-born Yankee. Those seven coffins were lowered to their final resting place and amidst the sound of the earth falling into those new-made graves, the band of Harris Light Cavalry broke forth in dear old playo hymn. And when those graves were finished, there was scarcely a dry eye present. And with heavy hearts, their company left that little burying ground, some swearing to avenge their deaths. So, John, you learned early on that freedom isn't free. Isn't it so, Dad? Mom told me how you got beat up in the civil rights struggles during the 60s. Isn't it so, my departed little brother? We were so proud of you when you joined the Army. 
We always thought that you would make it back home. Hello, welcome to Chatham. Well, thank you, good day. It's a beautiful place, isn't it? It's much, much larger than I had expected. Well, we, we get that a lot. There's so much here to see. There's so many layers of history, many stories, but equally fascinating, I see you got that great little book there. In this book, John Washington did spend at least one of his nights of freedom here. I am interested, there are a number of buildings. Right. Can you tell me anything about them? Right. What you've got are the buildings remaining, but luck would have it, the park has actually been doing some recent research that shows where other buildings were. Now, let me go get the information and I'll meet you back by the gate. Excellent. Right. Right. Now, we're on the east side of the house that's in front of us here. The other side was the main side or river entrance. The gardens weren't here. But the building here on the right, that was the laundry. It was slave operated. And here on the other side, this building, that was the kitchen, also slave run. Now, look at this sketch, really recently discovered by park historians. It's a soldier sketch found in New Jersey. There's the main house. Over here's the laundry. Here's the kitchen. But look, there seems to be another building to the left of the kitchen. Now, let's look at this sketch. It was done later in the winter of 1862-63. Look there. But you see, it, it looks a lot like it has a chimney in the middle. Just like the other one. Now, let me guess. A chimney in the middle. Does that mean... There could be two families. Exactly. Now, let's go over by the laundry, and there's a gate that'll take us to the front area by the river. What a wonderful view of the town we have from here. Well, and Union generals up at the main house, they thought so too. But of course, it was both a headquarters, and then it became a hospital for thousands of wounded soldiers. Well, but can you tell me a little bit more about the slave life here? All right, now, the, the builder, William Fitzhugh, and he was a wealthy man who put this up in, say, around 1770. He was the first owner, and he probably had between 60 and 90 slaves here at a time. They did things, the usual things, but I mean, field work, housework, cooking, laundry. In this case, some even fished in the river for him. That was because of the location. So what else can you tell me about slavery during that period? Well, there was the usual dreary experience, except of course necessary to fit you at least. But in 1804-05, that Christmas time, there was an uprising. They were mad because they felt their overseer made them go back to work too quickly after the holidays. Now, that had to be put down with force, there were deaths on both sides, a couple of slaves were sold off to the Caribbean, you know, sent south. And so you're saying there were many slaves who were born, lived, worked, and died right here? Yes, with their families, but what often happened, they were ripped from those families for no reason, sent away. Uh, a, a very interesting story, though, takes place at the end of the slave era. The owner of the place was named Hannah Coulter. She died and her will provided for the freeing of the slaves here at Chatham. They had a choice. They could either have their passage paid to Africa where there was this freed slave colony called Liberia, or they could work for the new guy. Now that was Horace Lacey. He took the will to court, overturned it on the basis of the law of the day. Slaves were not people who could make a choice but property who had no choice. Now, let's go back to your original question about the outbuildings, but I want to show you some things, so can you follow me up to the next terrace? 
Take a look at this photograph on the exhibit and look up at the house. Now here's my copy and see the red rectangle and look what I'm highlighting right here. Ah, uh, are those the old buildings from the sketch? Yes, they are. You know, with a hundred slaves here, you would have thought there would have been more buildings. Well, there were, or we know it now by that sketch. Now, when you go inside, the Park Service has developed a fly-around exhibit that shows where all of those buildings were. So you guys really take your history seriously around here. <laughs> well, I guess we do, but you and I have just scratched the surface here. Now, I know you want to get on with your driving tour, but got time for me to show you one more thing? Sure. Now, look back at the photograph, and here's a soldier in it against a tree, and to his right are these two trees. Now look up, look to the right at those two trees. Are those the same two trees? Yes, they are. They witnessed everything we're talking about, the slavery, the Civil War, uh, the 20th century. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing when you think of it. You know, I'd really like to bring my family back here next year. Well, we'd love to have all of you here, and then you could do the entire Trail to Freedom driving tour. Well, John Washington, you certainly didn't have any trouble finding employment. You were soon in charge of a division commander's kitchen and making the general and his entire staff very happy. Then the general asked you to take his horse Charlie and report to a captain. Then you guide the captain around Fredericksburg and identify prominent rebels. The next thing you know, the rebels are on their way to a prison in DC and you're out maneuvering across central Virginia with the Union Cavalry. But when you fell asleep at Chatham among the Union Army on the night of August 31st, you woke up without a soldier in sight. You knew it was time to hightail it to the north. But why didn't you hop a train here at Falmouth Station? A lot of the freed slaves did. Man, there's no evidence of that train depot here anymore. It's just a big parking lot around an Eagle's Lodge. Maybe you figured trying to hop a train here was just too risky with all the soldiers, equipment, and supplies being moved frantically through here. Listen to me. I'm having a one-way conversation with a guy who has been dead for a century. Well, John Washington, did you pass through the Leland Station area? Let's see. The whole, the whole of Burnside's division had fallen back toward Aquia Creek on the Potomac River, 15 miles distant. My case was a critical one now indeed. A rain late at night had completely hid the track of the army, but I soon struck out for the railroad. After following it for some time, I left it and pursued the road toward Bell Plain Landing, nine miles distant. Well, we don't know if you made it here to Leland Station, do we, John? But what would you have seen had you come up the railroad line this far? There would have been a house just south of here called Bel Air. Abram Primer owned it and a 400 acre farm surrounding Bel Air. Abram was a Union sympathizer. He sent a son off to the Union Army, aided Confederate deserters, guided Union forces, let the Union cattle graze on his farm in the summer of 62, and the Union Army camped on his property in the winter of 1862 and 63. I know John Washington didn't use the Potomac Creek Bridge during his walk to acquire landing, but many of the self-emancipated slaves crossed it on trains during their evacuation. I'm looking forward to seeing the remains of the Bean Poles and Cornstalks Bridge. So, 
This is where the Confederates burned the railroad bridge at Potomac Creek as they retreated toward Fredericksburg in the early spring of 1862. And that's all that's left of it now. Can you imagine one engineer supervising unskilled soldiers as they cut two million feet of lumber and built a working railroad bridge 400 feet long and nearly 100 feet high in nine days. A few days later, President Lincoln walked across it and declared that he had seen the most remarkable structure that human eyes had ever rested upon. After bragging about the engineer, Herman Haupt, Lincoln said, and upon my word, gentlemen, there is nothing in it but bean poles and corn stalks. Hmm, I wonder if I can get up there. Jeez, I need to get back to some exercising. Well, look down there. I guess the bean pole bridge was a hundred feet high. But you didn't see the bean poles and cornstalks bridge, did you, John Washington? You walked well east of here, toward Bell Plain. That day would have been a lot easier for you if you had just hopped a train at Falmouth, my friend. It looks like Brooks Station today is a busy commuter train station. There is certainly no trace left of the station and depot that supported the Union Army. Its 11th and 12th Corps were camped all around here in the winter of 1862 and 1863. But the intersection of Andrew Chapel Road and Brook Road is interesting. That train trestle isn't Civil War era, but it's been here a long time. Look at how narrow it is. And that country general store and post office, that's cool. Wonder if the local folks wish that it was still open. Okay, John Washington, did you come through here at the end of your loop, out toward Bell Plain Landing? Here it is. After walking for some After distance, walking for I some time, I discovered the fresh tracks of horses going the same way that I was. Soon, I could hear voices. I stopped and listened, for I did not know whether they were rebel guerrillas or the Union Army. I hid in the thick undergrowth close by till I caught sight of a blue coat. My heart gave a great leap for joy. I was soon once more in the Union lines, and about two o'clock, arrived at a choir creek landing. Look at the green line marking the Civil War era rail line. It made a sharp turn right at this intersection. Oh, I get it. Today's asphalt road to a choir landing was put down over the old railroad bed. Now on to the last stop on the driving tour and the departure point for freedom in the north. Now that I've got to see. Wait in the water, wait Man, the yet water. another place in Stafford with lots of layers of history. The first European settler in the county built right over there. John Smith explored this area and the first naval engagement of the Civil War. The Battle of Acquire Creek was right here. That was some killed in action list. Two horses and a chicken. And that's where the docks were, and the north end of the RF&P Railroad terminated. That must have been an impressive operation to anybody. But imagine what that must have been like for the 10,000 self-emancipated slaves. Whoa. 
your head is running away with you. Slow down. Let's see what John Washington had to say about his time here. Hmm, I found the soldiers. I found the soldiers. Encamped for miles around the hundreds of steamers and transports of all descriptions, awaiting to receive their cargoes, which was being shipped in all haste. When I got there, the mail steamer Keyport was nearly ready to leave for Washington, D.C. The sentinel guarding the gangplank from the wharf to the steamer forbid me going aboard without a pass from General Burnside, whose headquarters was nearby. Need a pass signed by General Burnside's provost. Headquarters on the other side of the hill. Let's go. Move along. Call. Sergeant, I need to get to Washington City as soon as I can. Yes, ma'am. Please enter. I stood around a few minutes watching for an opportunity. When the Sentinel was reading another pass, I bounded across the gangplank and concealed myself for a while till the steamer got off from the wharf. I then came out and arrived safe at 6th Street Wharf in Washington, D.C. on the night of September 1st, 1862. That's pretty bold, John. Sounds like something I might do. Maybe you're my ancestor. When I first looked at that Trail to Freedom website, I somehow knew I had to come here. Now, I have felt my ancestors. Now I understand it's time for me to learn all I can about them and bring my family here. It's time they see and hear about the people who blazed the trail to their freedom. I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood and human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep like the rivers.